Moral agency is God's precious gift to his children. We're free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men, or to choose captivity and death according to the captivity and power of the devil. God won't force us to do good, and the devil can't force us to do evil. Though some may think that mortality is a contest between God and the adversary, a word from the Savior and Satan is silenced and banished. It is our strength that is being tested, not God's. In the end, we will therefore reap what our lifelong choices have sown. So what does the sum total of our thoughts, desires, words, and works say about our love for the Savior, his chosen servants, and his restored church? Do our baptismal, priesthood, and temple covenants mean more to us than the praise of the world or the number of likes on social media? Is our love for the Lord and his commandments stronger than our love for anything or anyone else in this life? The adversary and his followers have always sought to destroy the works of Christ and his prophets. The Savior's commandments, if not ignored altogether, have been rationalized into meaninglessness by many in today's world. Messengers of God who teach inconvenient truths are often dismissed. Even the Savior himself was called a man gluttonous and a winebibber, accused of disturbing public sentiment and being divisive. Weak and conniving souls took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk, and his sect of early Christians was everywhere spoken against. The Savior and his early followers dealt with serious internal and external opposition, and we experienced the same. Today, it is almost impossible to courageously live our faith without occasionally attracting a few actual and virtual fingers of scorn from the worldly. Confidently following the Savior is rewarding, but at times we may get caught in the crosshairs of those advocating an eat, drink, and be merry philosophy, where faith in Christ, obedience, and repentance are substituted by the illusion that God will justify a little sin because he loves us so much. Speaking by his own voice or by the voice of his servants, did the Savior not say about our day that the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, and that many shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables? Did he not lament that in vain do they worship me, teaching the doctrines, for doctrines the commandments of men? Did he not warn that of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them? Did he not foresee that evil would be called good and good evil, and that a man's foes shall be they of his own household? So what about us? Should we be intimidated or afraid? Should we live our religion at periscope depth? Surely not. With faith in Christ, we need not fear the reproach of men or be afraid of their revilings. With a Savior at the helm and living prophets to lead and guide us, who can be against us? Let us be confident, not apologetic, valiant, not timid, faithful, not fearful, as we hold up the Lord's light in these last days. The Savior made clear that whosoever, therefore, shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father. Consequently, while some would prefer a God who comes without commandments, let us boldly testify in the words of Elder D. Todd Christofferson that a God who makes no demands is the functional equivalent of a God who does not exist. While some would prefer to be selective in the commandments they follow, let us joyfully accept the Savior's invitation to live by every word which proceedeth forth out of the mouth of God. While many believe the Lord and his Church should condone doing whatsoever our heart desireth, let us valiantly proclaim that it is wrong to follow a multitude to do evil, because crowds cannot make right what God has declared to be wrong. O oh, remember, remember how strict yet liberating are the commandments of God. Teaching them clearly may at times be seen as an act of intolerance. Let us, therefore, respectfully demonstrate that it is not only possible but essential to love a child of God who embraces beliefs different from our own, 
We can accept and respect others without endorsing their beliefs or actions that do not align with the Lord's will. There is no need to sacrifice truth on the altar of agreeableness or social desirability. Zion and Babylon are incompatible. No man can serve two masters. Let's all remember the Savior's penetrating question, why call you me, Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Let us demonstrate our love for the Lord through wholehearted, voluntary obedience. If you feel caught between your discipleship and the world, please remember that your loving Savior sendeth an invitation, for the arms of mercy are extended to you, and he saith, Repent, and I will receive you. President Nelson taught that Jesus Christ will perform some of his mightiest works between now and when he comes again. But he also taught that those who choose the Lord's way will likely endure persecution. Being counted worthy to suffer shame for his name may at times be our lot as we allow his voice to take priority over any other. Blessed is he, the Savior said, whosoever shall not be offended in me. Elsewhere we learn that great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them, nothing. So let's ask ourselves, am I enduring for a while, but when tribulation or persecution arise because of the word, by and by, am I offended? Am I firmly built on the rock of Jesus Christ and his servants? More relativists advocate that truth is merely a social construct, that there are no moral absolutes. What they're really saying is that there is no sin, that whatsoever a man does is no crime, a philosophy for which the adversary is claiming proud authorship. Let us therefore beware of wolves in sheep's clothing who are always recruiting and often use their intellectual reservations to cover their own behavioral lapses. If we really want to be valiant disciples of Christ, we will find a way. Otherwise, the adversary offers enticing alternatives. But as faithful disciples, we need not apologize for our beliefs nor back down from that which we know to be true. In conclusion, a word about the 15 servants of God seated behind me. While the worldly say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not, the faithful are crowned with blessings from above, yea, and with commandments, not a few, and with revelations in their time. Not surprisingly, these men frequently become the lightning rods for those unhappy with the word of God as the prophets proclaim it. They don't realize that no prophecy of the scripture is to be of any private interpretation or the result of the will of man, but that holy men of God speak now as they are moved by the Holy Ghost. Like Paul, these men of God are not ashamed of the testimony of our Lord and are his prisoners in the sense that the doctrine they teach is not theirs, but his that called them. Like Peter, they cannot but speak the things which they have seen and heard. I testify that the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve are good and honest men who love God and his children and who are loved by him. Their words we should receive as if from the Lord's own mouth in all patience and faith. For by doing these things, the gates of hell shall not prevail against us, and the Lord God will disperse the powers of darkness from before us. No unhallowed hand can stop the work from progressing. It will march on triumphantly, with or without you or me. So choose ye this day whom you will serve. Don't be fooled or intimidated by the loud adversarial noises emanating from the great and spacious building. Their desperate decibels are no match for the serene influence of the still, small voice upon broken hearts and contrite spirits. I testify that Christ lives, that he is our Savior and Redeemer, and that he leads his Church through the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, thus assuring that we are not tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. True disciples of Jesus Christ, President Nelson taught, are willing to stand out, speak up, and be different from the people of the world. They are undaunted, devoted, and courageous. Brothers and sisters, 
It's a good day to be good. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen.